Good morning, everyone. Why don't you stand? This morning, we're just going to take a moment to get into worship. So I ask you to bow your heads and just pray amongst yourselves for a moment and just invite the Holy Spirit to this place.
stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's worth that will bless your Thank you. Thank you, band. Tremendous reminder. It's all about Christ. That's what we're here today. Okay. How many of you have ever been to Heartland Camp as a camper? Raise your hand. Wow. There they are. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask for a, a bold statement here. How many of you uh, that went to Heartland uh, either came to a first-time decision where you accepted Christ to be your Lord or made a commitment to Christ? Please stand. If you went to Heartland, you made a commitment to Christ at Heartland, or a recommitment, please stand. There you go. All right, thank you, thank you, awesome. Okay, uh, I have the privilege of introducing our speaker today. Uh, he's a man that I've watched and tracked uh, his work up at uh, Bob Nunziato is the director of Heartland Camp. He's been there for 24 years, and a camp is such a powerful ministry, 
And uh, Bob comes with uh, joy and enthusiasm and leadership, but most of all, uh, just a deep level of commitment to Christ and serving him up at Heartland. So please welcome Bob Nunziato. All right, it is indeed an honor and privilege to be here. I wanted to ask sort of variation on that question, and I'm curious, how many have never, ever been to Heartland Christian Camp? If you could raise your hand. All right, amen. So there's some possibilities here. Well, I, you are invited. I'd love to have you come. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Heartland, but I'm, I'm here really to tell you more about what God is doing in my life. And so to begin, I'd like to direct you to Mark 10:45. It's a verse in the New Testament where Jesus says this, that he, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, giving his life as a ransom for many. And I share that verse for two reasons. One, it displaced Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 as my life verse. It really embodies all that my bride and I a desire to serve our Lord and Savior, but serve with a purpose, pointing people to Jesus. And not only is it my life verse, but it has become Heartland's verse. And so if you come to Heartland, my hope and desire is that two things would happen. You would be served and that you would see Jesus, that you would be pointed to our Lord and Savior who paid the ultimate price, as you so well know, by his death burial and resurrection so that we might have life, that he paid, the rent, he paid a penalty that we could not pay. So those are the two. Mark 1045 is the verse for my life and Heartland Christian Camp. Now, as a desire to serve, we have a facility, a camp. Some of you may be aware that recently that camp was threatened. And so uh, Mr. Knock asked me to share a little bit about the fire and our experience with that. And then I'd like to dive into to my, my story, my testimony. September 9th, a uh, storm system came into the Sierras. You're perhaps aware. Uh, I don't know if there was much rain. I was in, in the mountains. But the result of that storm is there was a lot of lightning, a little rain, a lot of lightning, and two fires were started to the south of Heartland, Paradise and the Colony fires. They started as very small fires. They weren't discovered until the 10th of September. And starting at about the evening of the 10th of September, from the area of Heartland, you could see s columns of smoke, very small, small columns, but columns which in the, the uh, again, as we head out of summer and the fall is not a good sign. We watched those fires carefully as they moved from the south to the north. On the 30th of September, they, were, they had been hanging for several days to the south of the North Kauia. There was a, there's a river, it's rocky, uh, the fire had been holding south, and as long as it held south, it was not a threat to Heartland or our community. The afternoon of the 30th, I got a call the fire had jumped the line, and it was time for our team to leave. We were asked to leave. So we went from a, an advisory to a mandatory evacuation. The staff did a marvelous job. We got things out. Uh, I had arranged with the chief uh, and the Tulare County Sheriff, SO, to, to, to be able to stay, even though there was a mandatory evacuation. There's just so many infrastructure in a camp. There's wells and generators and pipes and they're, they're drafting water and just to, to support them. And so the night of the, the 30th, we were, myself and a couple of the staff were allowed to stay. And the fire was progressing from above. It had jumped the Kui and made a little bit of a run, but it was kind of settling down for the night. And so we got into the 1st of October and things were looking good. They were, the, they were testing the sprinklers. The fire department was pretty calm. Everything was okay. We were finishing up putting foil on, on the buildings, on the vents and some of that thing, just touching some things up. And then we discovered that the fire had made a move. And I'll never forget Jesse, the BC, coming up to me and going, Bob, you got to go. And I wanted to say, I, th I thought we had an arrangement here, but he says, go. And sure enough, the, the fire just made a run towards camp. Uh, we were out. They started gelling the buildings uh, as I leave, was leaving I passed just, I stopped counting after about 55. The fire trucks were coming up the hill to protect Heartland. And the good news is that God preserved the camp during the, the day of the 1st of October and into the, that night. Now, having gotten down the hill, I'm obviously very interested in watching the fire. 
and you know, there's the amazing tools online, and I'll just all to say and just to, to point out something that God taught me is I, when I left camp, I had a peace about leaving. Um, but that piece was tested when I was watching on the computer and I saw this because we were warned that there's these spots that come out ahead of the fire. And I watched a spot and then I started to watch it come south or part. Yeah, come south. So it was north of us, come south. And it was headed for the northeast corner of our property, which is the, the least protected and most vulnerable. This is not good. So I watched it and she started to form a long slender line. And I go, this can't be. And there's a road on one side. They'd done some... some uh, were, and I had, I, part of my problem is I couldn't quite, the, the, was not lining up with the map real well, but there's a road that, it, that I thought it was running against. Long story short is that it's coming very close to camp. I'm, I'm going, this is, this is not good. So I text the chief. I said, chief, somebody have eyes on this. It looks like there's a spot fire coming right for us. And so he immediately called me. He says, what are you looking at? I told him. He looked on it. He says, just, okay, give me a sec. He says, Bob, relax. That's us. We're lighting the backfire. And I just go, oh, you got to be kidding. And it was a great news. So the fire rolled by us, went through Redwood Canyon, up across the General's Highway. And from that point, things have calmed down. And the good news is today, from Heartland Christian Camp, there is no evidence when you look around of the fire. And we want to, I, I just give testimony to God's hand of protection. That's the great news. The best news is that I have to believe in a time when other camps have not been so fortunate. I'll point you to Sierra Bible Camp this summer, Camp Hammer a year ago that were completely destroyed. So with humility and just gratitude to our Lord, we're looking to the future, excited about what he's going to do through the ministry of Harlan. There's got to be a reason that he has preserved it. So that's the good news. So that's a little update on the fire. Now to my story. My father is a pastor. I have a brother three years younger than I. Grew up in Southern California. At the age of six, and prior to the, well, at the age of six, my mom passed away. The story and the reason I share that is that I realized that some of you experienced grief and loss in your life, and I understand. Watched my mom for, even though I was very young, I vividly remember it, watched my mom decline in health into a wheelchair, ultimately into a hospital bed, and ultimately to our Lord and Savior. Life, post-mom, my dad remarried. I understand stepmom, great stepmom. She's mom. Okay, move up into junior high. In junior high, doing okay student. Not the greatest student. Not bad. Had six lawn jobs, pool cleaning job, paper route. I'm away to getting an Eagle Scout. Back then, Boy Scouts were quite a bit different. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, but, I, but life was going well for me until the morning of February 9th of 1971. And that morning, it began with the window. And we were in an older home living in Burbank at the time. It had the sash window where it, it, their wood frame, and the, the, after a while, the glazing gets, gets a little loose. And so the windows start to, to rattle. And, and it began with the window rattling. It went from rattling to the house shaking and I was experiencing the earthquake. Uh, the, it's a Silmar earthquake is one of the names that they had it, but it was the February 9th earthquake down in, in Southern California. And it did something that nothing else had done to that point in my life, and it scared me to death. And I mean that literally. I, at that point, for the first time, life had just, I felt like I had things going my way, but that moment and in the ensuing days, I had a real crisis because until that point, I felt like I could do things to fix things, and I, I couldn't. And not only was there the problem with the initial earthquake, that, that, that we kind of rode through, it's the following aftershocks, some of which are incredibly jarring and incredibly scary. I mean, I, I didn't want to take a little kid at the time. I didn't want to take a bath. I didn't want to get in the shower. I didn't want to... I didn't want to be anywhere that I couldn't be prepared to run out in the street. The problem is they're talking about, you know, the earth opening up. I mean, it just, your mind as a kid goes crazy. I was scared. And I didn't know what to do about that. March of that year, I was invited to a camp. Now, when I say camp, it's not like Heartland. It's not like Hume. It's just a, a basic uh, cabin Three-story, yeah, three-story with a basement, or two-story with a basement, I guess better say, upstairs 
they had a uh, area where they had uh, beds for the girls to stay in. Down below in the basement, they had some bunks for the guys to stay in. The middle floor, there was a place to eat, a little kitchen area, and then a their big living room where we met. And on the night of March 28th in 1971, as a PK or pastor's kid who'd been to church, who'd been in the Christmas place, who'd held the palm branch for Palm Sunday, who'd literally been in church perhaps most, if not all Sundays, who knew about the, the Christmas story and about Christ, about his birth, about his death, about his resurrection, the stone. I knew all about that. But on the night, the March 28, 1971, I went from knowing about Christ to personally knowing Christ as I asked him to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me, to make me a new creature, and I invited him to come into my life as my Lord and Savior. From that point, we kind of marched through junior high into high school, into college. In college, I got involved with the inner varsity. And uh, again, at camp, just another, another part in my life. San, um, San, Gregonia, pardon me, San Gabriel Mountains, I don't know the name of the camp, uh, but I was at a camp, inner varsity camp, and Paul Friesen, who was at the time the director at a camp on Catalina Island, and I spoke uh, Saturday, just before lunch, and at that meeting, Paul Friesen said, Bob, I was thinking about going into forestry, I love the mountains, I love backpacking and camping. He said, Bob, have you ever thought about Christian camping? Never crossed my mind. I'd been a camper at Hume, but I, I didn't never, didn't, yes, people worked, I hadn't never thought of it. He planted the seed that God then watered and fertilized and grew. I came up and interviewed uh, and um, January of 1978 with Frances Workington. She was the hiring. Uh, her husband, Walter, was the director at Hume Lake Christian Camp. He would say later that over his objection, she hired me for the summer of 1978 in accommodations. That's cleaning the bathrooms, floors, etc. And so I uh, got my VW square back, drove to Hume, and prior to Memorial Day, uh, started my, my camping career at Hume Lake. My i got to tell you this very briefly. My first job, so that I was supposed to work in, in accommodations, which I did for the summer, but they needed somebody to help out in the boathouse. So literally, if you've been to Hume, my first day of work was, in the first weekend, more really weekend, was sitting in the boathouse, handing out paddles and life preservers and taking money and looking out at the beautiful lake. It was a great way to start a camping, uh, camping career. I then went from that to the next uh, summer as well at Hume, and then in 1980, uh, I was hired full-time, and uh, from that point on, they created positions. I had the honor and privilege of serving at Meadow Ranch all those years, the junior high facility. I did uh, the specialty camps, father-son, father-daughter, police, fire, all of those, uh, marketing. I just I worked with a wonderful team until in 1997, the Lord called my bride and I and our two sons to Heartland. And we've had the privilege of serving the Lord at Heartland since then. And it's just an honor, it's a privilege, and it's a delight to be able to do that. As our time is going to wrap up, I wanted to take you to something that I've been learning recently. When the, we were put into the um, evacuation warning, as a staff, we, we, we decided what items we needed to take off the hill as well our personal belongings at our homes. And I wish I could take you back to October 1st, take you to my home, uh, walking up the stairs to our porch. The smoke is heavy from the fire. I've been asked to evacuate. I know this is my last trip in, to my home. I have to decide if there's anything I've missed what am I going to take? So I, I wish I could take you to my living room because I learned something very valuable. As I was standing in the living room, my bride was already down the hill, forced to decide what am I going to take. I had to make a decision. What am I going to take? That led me to the important question of what's important. What's important in my life? 
And when I looked around the home, while well, there's things, and I took a picture, I realized what was in that home wasn't the most important thing in my life. The things weren't the most important thing in my life. The people were the most important thing in my life, and they were safe. And I was at peace, closing the door and realizing that I may, I may come back and I might find that the house is gone, burned to the ground. And I was, I was at peace with that. I would ask you this morning, and I know it's hard because you can't go there. You don't have the smoke. You don't have the, the, your throat. You don't have all the sensation. You don't have the urgency of the, this impending fire. Your life is not today. Your life, I pray and hope, is not going to be threatened in any way. You, like me, can be coasting through junior high, coasting through high school, coasting through college. Just something that God has taught me on that 1st of October, what's important, and it's people. And I'd like to leave you with this verse as I've been, I've been uh, really trying to get a handle on this. So it's out of the 15th chapter of John, 12th verse. He has a command. Jesus has a commandment for us. And he said, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. And so since I discovered that people and not things were the most important and that Jesus' commandment is to love one another, so how, do, how do we do that? What does that look like? And I believe that verse that verse answers the question, just as I have loved you. And so I'd like to leave you this morning with this challenge. The way that you're going to succeed in loving others is by getting to know our Savior and how he loves you. I don't know what that'll look like for you. Some people like to get up in the morning, have a quiet time. Other people like to do it in the evening. But I would challenge you today, if you're like me, just kind of cruising through, just checking the, checking the boxes, you might consider another path. Father, this, this morning I would like to thank you so much for, for this school. I, I thank you for... Mr. Wood and his leadership, and for the board, I thank you for each teacher, for all those that help, for the support staff, Mr. Kanak and his 50 years or more of faithful service, what a true picture of someone faithful. And Lord, this morning I pray for the students that have been so patient and attentive and respectful, kind to listen to my story. Father, it's really your story of taking a sinner who Thought he was okay, thought he was doing good, but was, was far from far, far. And when squeezed, discovered that, that I was afraid of dying because I didn't know, I didn't know you. And so, Father, thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for changing my life. Thank you for camp, which is a place where you've met me, where you've met others, as demonstrated earlier by those who stood and I pray in the days, weeks, and months ahead, Father, that you would use Heartland, that it would boldly, that the ministry would boldly proclaim through its speakers, boldly proclaim your living word. And that those campers that come, like I, would listen to your word, listen to what you've done for us, what we couldn't do and that many would make decisions to follow you. Father, I pray for these students that you'll give them a great rest of the day. I just am so honored to have had the privilege of being here this morning and pray that in some way they may take from your word, either out of Mark 10:45 or John 15:12, 12, 
Father, help us to love one another as you have loved us. Amen. Thank you. Hang on, Bob. Hang on. We're going to pray for you, Bobby. Bobby. Bob. No? No. <laughs> you did not. You did good. <laughs> you did real good. <laughs> I, tell you, I don't know about you, but it's just a, a great joy to see God's hand on a man's life, a woman's life, and uh, watch him work. And uh, so why do we ha have these stories of your people, how they got to Christian camping, how they got to fellowship Christian athletes, how they got to business, how they got to leading a school? That's you. We want you people. Pass the baton. Some of you need to step up, get into camping. Uh, my wife and I uh, have spent about four years uh, on staff up at, uh, uh, after, after we were married, a couple of years on staff at Hume Lake, and then I spent some time serving in Heartland. It's, it's a lot of fun, but it's really rewarding. Some of you need to be a camper coming up to Heartland uh, these uh, days to come, and uh, so uh, be looking forward to seeing what God's going to do with you folks, the next generation, right? Let's pray for Bob. Thank you, Lord. The testimony of one man. It's a powerful work when you take and change the course of a man's life and you use him for your glory. Thank you for Bob's leadership at Heartland. Thank you for his love for you. Thank you for his direction in the way you've taken that camp and uh, through tough times, Lord. Continue to be with him. Thank you for protecting Heartland and the people up there. And Lord, bless this day. We'd figure out those ways that you want each of us to serve you because you came to serve us. How can we not but want to serve you back? We pray these things in your wonderful name, Jesus. Amen. Okay. Uh, if any of you would like to, uh, maybe uh, God spoke something to you today. We're going to ask Bob to come down. Anybody else to come share a word with Bob? Come on down and meet Bob. He's uh, just a lot of fun. And he's got one of those cool names that's hard to pronounce. Nunziato. All right, there you go. Seniors. I've been empty. When I'm low, you fill the cup. Yeah,